Welcome to the Trinity Table Talk podcast, a resource for Trinity Anglican Church out of Littleton, Colorado. It will be the goal of this podcast to serve as a resource for theological education and spiritual reflection for all those who might listen. This season, we'll be taking a deeper look into the Sunday morning liturgy. My name is Andrew Winnegar, and I'm joined by Tim Suits, the rector of Trinity Anglican Church. Uh, So last week, we talked about the first part of the service all the way up to that first collect. And then now we talk about the the section of the liturgy, the section of the Sunday service, um, broadly referred to as the ministry of the word. Um, And before I, I guess before we get into the first act, which is the reading of scripture, um, you've talked a lot about the ministry of the word in, in your sermons. So what, how would you broadly characterize this portion of the service? What is important to know that applies to everything and not just one specific part? I think the thing that's important to understand in the ministry of the word is that we believe that Christ Jesus is presently speaking to his people when we gather for worship, when we read his word, Uh, And when we preach his word, Mm. that while you may see agents of communication, whether that's a man or a woman reading Holy Scripture or whether it's one of the pastors preaching a word, that we really do believe that Christ Jesus himself, the word, the Logos, who spoke creation in in the beginning, the same God who called forth Israel out of Egypt into life with him, the same God who called Abraham out of idolatry into covenantal faithfulness with him, the same God that uh, said, Lazarus, right, come out, the mm-hmm. same God that uh, said, will say, behold, I'm making all things new. That is the God who speaks, and when he speaks, he acts and he creates. Mm-hmm. And so in the ministry of the word, we really believe that Christ Jesus, the Logos, the word himself, is speaking forth a people, a covenantal people, by proclaiming to them who they are and who he is and what their relationship is, Mm. right? He is proclaiming his gospel message of reconciliation with God week in and week out. Yes, through fallen vessels, right? Um, There are times in which we stumble when we read the scriptures, right? There are times in which the sermon doesn't land, right? And yet we still hold in faith that Christ Jesus is present and Christ Jesus is speaking. Mm. And so one way to think about it, and these these terms don't actually map terribly well, but I think it can help you uh, and just help people in general. So when Anglicans use the word sacramental, what that tends to mean is that this sacrament, whether it's the Eucharist, right, bread and wine, or uh, the baptismal waters, that God is communicating, Christ Jesus is communicating to us his gospel truth, right? My body was poured out for you or broken for you. My blood was poured out for you. I will wash you. I will cleanse you. I will feed you. I will sustain you. I will carry you through the waters, right? We always say Christ Jesus is speaking in the sacrament, that while you might see a priest handing you the bread, handing you the cup, it is actually Christ Jesus communicating that to you. So too in the ministry of the word, it requires an embodied presence of a human being, a mediator, yet it is Christ Jesus communicating through that human agent Hmm. to you. So that like um, that classic division of the liturgy of word and sacrament, that division you can't draw too hard of a line because there's a lot of word in the sacrament. There's a lot of sacrament in the word. Yeah. I would say the entire thing is logos, logos, right? Word, right? We have the word communicated, uh, through the mouth, right. And received by the ears. But then the reformers would also call a sacrament, the visible word, Right. So it's the word communicated with our eyes and our senses, our other senses other than our ears. So it really is just Jesus all the way through. It's just Jesus speaking and then Jesus touching us. Hmm. That's good. 
So we move into the first part of the ministry of the word, which is for us, the reading of the Psalms and then a New Testament passage. Or an old, if we're preaching in an old. Yeah. Yeah. yeah an Old Testament passage. And then we have the, the gospel reading. Yes. So I've noticed something at Trinity that I find to be really interesting because I've, you know, you go to different Anglican churches and I've noticed that a lot of Anglican churches, they will sit for all but the gospel reading, mm -hmm. but we stand for all of it. Yes. Why is that? So we have to recognize that almost all of our physical responses liturgically are at the end of the day, adiaphorous, meaning things indifferent, mm. right? You could do them or you could not do them. It is not a gospel issue. So for example, some churches pass around the communion plate because to them, it's important that you sit so that grace comes to you. Mm. That's for them is an important image that is communicated, that communicates gospel proclamation. We b prefer an image of God's people rising and as one body coming forward and yet receiving with empty hands. So in that, we think we get, well, we get kind of multiple images of beauty here. We get the collective body of Christ. We do get the idea that you are called to respond to grace and yet you come empty handed. But at the end of the day, is one church better because you sit and pass the communion plate and one that you walk forward? No right? So to some churches sit under the word of God. So that says we sit mm -hmm. to receive others stand in honor of the word of God, right? Mm -hmm. Like when a King enters his court, you stand to recognize his authority and do honor his presence, right? Like you stand for the national anthem, mm -hmm. right? You stand when a bride comes down the aisle, right? You stand for the word of God read, I prefer that image, although I know that some of you might say I don't because I get tired of standing after a while. <laughs> but that's really why. There is no, we're better than other Anglican churches on that. Both are trying to communicate reverence. Okay. We believe that it's better. I prefer the reverence to be communicated through standing in honor of God's word. Okay. I had always thought, I think it was through conversations with Kyle but of course, we stand for the gospel reading and, and the cross, if you do the movements of the cross, mm -hmm. the cross comes into the middle of the people and the deacon gives the gospel reading. And the message there is that like Christ is amongst his people, mm -hmm. just as he became a person, just as he became incarnate, he's amongst his people. And so we stand for that and we look to the cross and my understanding was just as we stand in the gospels mm. or in the gospel reading, we stand because we see the presence of Christ in every other part of scripture in the Psalms and the old Testament, mm -hmm. of course, in the new Testament and in, especially in the gospel reading. Yeah. Um, so I find that interesting to, to hear something different. Yeah. I feel yeah. Like. I think, but I do think it's beautiful too, of the recognition that we stand in reverence to Christ Jesus in the Psalms, we stand in reverence to Christ Jesus in Genesis all the way to Revelation. It is all pointing to him. Hmm. But you bring up another really important point that we stand for the gospel reading and that the, the, the word of God comes to the middle, right? Now, some Anglican churches don't use a cross. They just use the Bible, right? Um, but either way, the gospel is read amongst the people. And there's a few key images here that are, I think, incredibly helpful. One is the incarnational reality that is communicated, that Christ Jesus stands amongst us. Mm -hmm. Two uh, is the reality that the gospel is what unifies us. Mm -hmm. What stands in the middle of us is not our political affiliation, not our ethnic affiliation, not our national affiliation, but the gospel is the only thing strong enough to hold us together. But the other interesting component is this, is if you've ever sat um, and you look at someone across the room and you can see them looking at the same cross as you, it also is this beautiful image that the cross is our mediator between one another, that only the cross can reconcile human beings 
to one another. That if two people in the church become at conflict and at odds with one another, the only hope that they can be reconciled and brought into oneness is through the power of the cross. Mm -hmm. And so not only do we see that the cross unifies us, not only do we see that the cross reveals the incarnation, but we also see that the cross is the only thing that can heal us and bring us together when there's a fracture in the church. Mm -hmm. That's good. So after the gospel reading, we have the most important part of the Sunday service, announcements. Yeah. Tell me about that. I'm just kidding. Um, so after the I'm announcements. I'm so bad at announcements. I'm so <laughs> glad I don't do those anymore. <laughs> Thank God for Connor. Yeah. Right? Um, so we send a the... voice for radio. <laughs> um, so then we get into the sermon. And, I, you know, it wasn't too long ago. I was talking to somebody and um, I was just mentioning if, if your goal is to learn systematic theology, uh, a 30 minute lecture once a week, not a good method of of trying to learn systematic theology. Yeah. Um, so that's like not what it's trying to accomplish. That's a bad way of looking at it. But so, so what is preaching trying to do or why is it important? Maybe is a better question. Yes. Um, I, I heard a number of questions in there. So let me try to take them one at a time. Maybe first, what is the difference between preaching and a Sunday school class. Yeah, I right? love it. So Sunday school class is inherently conversational, right? It is it is a conversation uh, around a topic of some kind. You can interject, you can ask questions, things like that. Why is it that the church has never allowed that, right? Mm. There are some like kind of, you know, when the... Um, when evangelicals for a while there were just constantly trying to redo church and reinvent it, there was definitely a group of people that were like, we're going to make all of our sermons conversational. And they never, you know, it's fine. Maybe that worked out. Um, probably didn't. Uh, but I wonder, did they stop and ask, why has the church never done that? Hmm. Why is it that the church has always said, one person is going to talk here right now and everyone's going to be quiet and listen? And it's because it's the pattern of scripture, right? Mm. God speaks forth his people first in a unilateral call of grace, right? Abraham was called out of darkness into life with God, right? Israel was called out of slavery in Egypt into resurrected life with God through their death and resurrection out of the Red Sea, right? So too, you and I were called out of our death in sinfulness into life in Christ. And the ministry of the word through preaching is a revelation that God speaks and we are called to listen. Uh, Martin Luther said that the organs, not organ as in like the big giant thing that you play in an old cathedral, but like the organ, like your heart is an organ. The organs of faith are the ears. Hmm. because the ears can only receive. Faith is inherently a receptive task, not a grasping task, right? Hmm. The ears cannot speak. The ears cannot grasp. The ears can only receive what is given to them. So too, we can only receive the grace that God gives us, hmm. right? And each week what we do in the word is we sit and we listen to Christ Jesus, gather his people together, Proclaim who he is, who they are, and who they are now through his redemptive grace that he has given them. And so that's very different than a classroom setting. Now, I think that a classroom setting is, is important to clarify the questions that inherently arrive, arise through preaching, right? Jesus did not just call forth his disciples and then never talk to them again right? He called them forth and yet he had conversations with them. The sermon is not the point of conversation, right? The point, the, 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 the point of conversation is the, the dialogue of the liturgy with God and his people, the life of prayer. Uh, but the sermon is a reminder that God addresses his people and in addressing them forms his people. Hmm. Because never forget when God speaks, he creates, right? And so when God speaks, 
speaks forth through his agents, those who preach, he is forming a people. He is shaping a people. He is recreating a people through his effectual, meaning active, working word. Hmm. It reminds me of um, like the, uh, the prophets, in the Old Testament, right? Like you compare them to an instructor or a theology professor. And, and what are they both doing at core? Conveying information. They're proclaiming truth to one degree or another. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the professors to one degree or another. Sure. Um, but prophets aren't just declaring information. They're not just giving information. But in it is the call of God towards repentance, towards faith. It's not just to instruct. It's to move. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, preaching has a lot more to do with prophecy mm -hmm. than it does just instructing. That's right. And I think that that kind of gets into maybe Trinity's philosophy of preaching, right? Is we really believe that our responsibility as the preachers of Trinity is to proclaim to you as prophets of God, his gospel word for you every week. Every week has to be gospel preaching that we were dead in our sins and transgressions, and yet God in his infinite mercy chose to bring us into life through the substitutionary life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. That word is for you today. So that's kind of our first, always, first, what are we trying to do? That, right? And always that as it faithfully is revealed in that scriptural text. But we believe every scriptural text will point us to the gospel in some way or another. Uh, the other thing we do want to do is we do want to instruct. We want to teach you every Sunday what is right doctrine, what is true, what is good, uh, what is beautiful, how Christ Jesus helps you make sense of your life. We want to teach you what is true. Um, we also know that you will only receive what is true if you are attached to God meaning if you are living in a relationship of love with him. And so we're always trying to also communicate that to you through your affections as much as through your mind, showing you the love of God in order to show you the truth of what God has done for you. Um, we also are, are very convicted, um, not only that we preach uh, the gospel every week, not only that we preach truth but also the sermon is meant to show you how to handle Holy Scripture, hmm. right? Um, you might have noticed, like, I'll never say, I'll never get preoccupied with the ancient Near Eastern traditions and cultural narrative around the Scriptures. Now, some people do that, and there's some good to that, but there's also some deep problems to it, because what ends up happening is it unintentionally communicates to God's people that unless you have an expert understanding of Greek and Hebrew, <laughs> excuse me, and uh, an expert understanding of the archaeological evidence around ancient Babylon and Roman history, then scripture is impossibly distant from you. Hmm. And that is communicated very regularly unintentionally by very intelligent biblical scholars. Yeah. And we all need to just collectively ignore them. <laughs> there are helpful things that can come out of that, but they are far fewer than what they want you to believe. Hmm. The scripture is available to you. Hmm. You can pick it up and you can read it and you can see Christ Jesus speaking in it. And I want to assure you every week that Yes, you can learn some wonderful things by studying the history. And, and if that really excites you and grows you closer to Jesus, you should do that. I don't want to diminish that. And yet the Bible is not impossibly distant from you. Mm -hmm. I really want to communicate that to you. And then finally, you know, not only do I want you to, you know, hear the gospel, not only do I want you to grow in your knowledge of who God is and who you are and how to understand the world, not only do I want you to know how to read the Bible, but I also want to teach you how to be ministers of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Right. I hope every Sunday that you leave saying, I felt cared for. Right. Preaching is a mode of pastoral care. The reason why we spend so much time preparing our sermons, not just in terms of the theological content, but how is this speaking to our people is because we believe we are ministers of the gospel. We are 
caregivers of God's people. And so we gather together for all of us to come together to say, we're going to get pastored right now. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim hopefully is going to open up our hearts to God and the Holy Spirit is going to minister to us through this text. And my prayer for all of you is that you each would be equipped to then go forth in your lives to be ministers of the gospel wherever you are. Mm. Um, that as you have been ministered to, you can then go out and minister. Because my job is simply to equip you to be a minister of the gospel, right? Your job is not to, you know, tithe so that I then go do the ministry, <laughs> right? My job is to equip you to go do the ministry. And the ministry of the word is a place where that is modeled effectively for God's people. Hmm. I feel like that's been, um, been impressed upon me as, as I have been learning to preach and getting like preaching more and more and whatnot. It's just that, uh, yeah, there's definitely this perception of like, why would I, why would I go and listen to whoever's sermon like i need to be served or i need to be pastored in this other way and now that i'm the one like in the pulpit i'm like no the pulpit is is my primary way of pastoring hmm. like that's what i'm putting all of my energy into mm -hmm. um it's been a, a dynamic shift for sure especially because of a sacramental view of preaching that's not right. just a yeah. lectern view of preaching or mm -hmm. whatever um well, I do want to move to the Apostles' Creed, but I also know that, you know, preaching is is just a huge emphasis for us as Reformational Anglicans, for our diocese. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything you want to say before I move on to the Apostles' Creed? I, I don't want to make this podcast too long, so let me just say this very, very briefly. I do think that we, with so much online preaching available, I do wonder if we do not... If we need to grow in our awareness that preaching is an inherently embodied practice, mm. that just as you can't take communion <laughs> online, so too, I'm not sure you can really listen to a sermon online. You can listen to something that's like a sermon, something that's similar to a sermon, but you can't listen to a sermon. I've never heard Martin Lloyd-Jones preach, right? I've heard so many of his sermons recorded. Right. But I've never heard him preach because I was never there. There is something inherently embodied about preaching that we need to regather and restore in an online age. So yeah. that'd be my last point I'd like to make is it is a relationship uh, that you have with a person that then grows pastorally in that way. Yeah. So let's move on to the creed, shall yeah. we? And that kind of gets back to like two episodes ago, embodiment. Embodiment. Of like, that's just who we are as human beings. Correct. Yeah. We're not meant to experience the world through computer screens and headphones and whatnot. Um, but yes, the Apostles' Creed. So after the sermon, there's a prayer. And then uh, Tim will say, would you join in me in reciting our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed or yes. Nicene Creed, depending on the season. Yeah. Well, okay. So there's an important point there. The actual Anglican standard is the Nicene Creed every week. Oh, okay. Because okay. it's a more, more textured whole creed. Uh, we are in a We're just wild lazy. minor. We, well, the reality <laughs> is, uh, to be truthful, um, Yes, we we really are trying to be mindful of time. No, oh, to be frank, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, many Angli most Anglican churches are are very small, and they don't have a kajillion kids. <laughs> and so to expedite the process, we just say, hey, these are both the two Catholic creeds. Uh, we've chosen the shorter option for yeah. honestly for the sake of time. Yeah. I do think the Nicene Creed is more robust, more poetic, more beautiful, and I I prefer it. Um, right. however, for the sake of time, standard Sundays, we utilize the Apostles' Creed. Now, why do we do the Creed every Sunday? Uh, I once heard it said that, uh, in, uh, historic Anglican, liberal Anglican churches in the United States, uh, thank God for the Creed because then you could wash your ears out from the sermon you just heard, <laughs> right? Uh, at least that was going to be, you know, you know, taking a bath after this, the just 
trash you just bathed in in the sermon. <laughs> I hope that's not the case at Trinity. Uh, rather, at Trinity, I hope it is simply a confirmation in which God invites his, mini- his, his priesthood of all believers, his ministers of the gospel to stand and join in the ministry of the word by proclaiming together, this is what we believe, this is who we affirm, and it's a covenant renewal service every Sunday. Mm -hmm. This is where we stand. We recite the words of our common faith every Sunday to remind us the whole story of Scripture, the sweeping narrative of Scripture, uh, each and every week. And we think that that's incredibly important um, because it joins our voices with the historic church, the faithful, that have come before us and will come after us. Uh, but it also is a, a good way of, of getting those words into God's people, of understanding very complex Trinitarian theology, uh, a complex understanding of the unity of the church, um, and really r- reminding ourselves who our God is and who we are. Hmm. Well, next episode, we'll talk about the response to the word, but I think that's a good place to end this episode. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for joining us on this episode. For more information about Trinity Anglican Church, please visit trinitylittleton.com.